Welcome back to the Sloppy Lab. Uh, we have quite a crew and quite a topic in store for you today. So uh, I guess I'll say to uh, to Quick Craw, welcome to Good Evening. Yep, good to see you again this week, JT. Yeah, and who are these faces uh, we have around the lab table with us tonight? <laughs> uh, I guess uh, uh, S.T. Uh, Russell, back for another another show. We didn't scare you off. Didn't scare me off. I'm happy to be back. Thank you guys for having me back for another episode. <laughs> and, and you're ready now. Yeah, yeah. Now it's uh, now. <laughs> That's it's right. Like, you're stuck it's with like me. Stuck on the bottom of the shoe. <laughs> Can't uh, shake them off. <laughs> And, yeah, I'm on uh, the bottom of the beaker. I can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> and a lab worker who doesn't know better yet than to avoid us. <laughs> Welcome, JDG. JDG314. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, great indeed. We're excited. So uh, we have three uh, NKFL veterans on the show and uh, one Nordic Hexad newbie. Uh, and we're going to be talking great. Nordic Hexad this evening. So I am the newbie in case anyone wasn't sure. <laughs> just want to make that very clear. Trigger warning here. I am going to be the noob on this one, but uh, I'm super eager to hear about this. Like you guys talk about this format all the time. It's a super cool format. A lot of strategy involved and in, in interest. Uh, I just haven't got into it just because of the, you know, time zone difference and the, t the commitment for doing a league like this, but it, that is not for lack of interest. It's a really cool format and I cannot wait to hear from you guys on this one. Yeah. You know, for a game that's, uh, for a game that's dead, there are no shortage of leagues out there. Although I guess you can't really make that joke anymore, can you? <laughs> the joke is dead. That's the joke sure. is dead. Long live the joke. I don't know, right? Um, mm. So I guess uh, first uh, first things first, uh, then the second thing second. That's how these things go. If you switch them, it'd be the other way. Um, uh, some announcements. Uh, I only really had one. Uh, we are one week into the ABR League. Love the ABR League. And also kicking off, uh, um, I'm very excited about this, the ABR Fantasy League. And uh, mm -hmm. teased it teased it on the ABR server earlier today, but I uh, wanted to share with y'all some of the first, first kind of results and stats from some of those fantasy teams that were, uh, that were put together. Uh, very fun, kind of fun to see, uh, you know, when we put some of the uh, players in the driver's seat, what, what lineups they crafted. Um, so I have here revealed with y'all for the first time um, those lineups and some of the initial stats. Uh, so we got to hand it to the noble one, not only noble, but also prescient, uh, who claimed six points out of an available seven and is leading the pack. Mm. I'm not going to dwell too much on the lineups here, but I do. Oh, wow. Want, mm. Yeah, 30, wow. 30, 30 folks, 30, 30 players uh, <laughs> jumped in. Uh, quick draw is not your uh, not Man. a great showing. <laughs> Goodness, and was, there, was there anyone here um, that I picked on my fantasy team that let me down last week? Is there anyone? I probably let you down last week. Yeah, it looks like it was St. Russell right there. Um, I actually, oh. I totally forgot who I had picked. I, I didn't know. And so when you pulled this up just now, I saw myself at the bottom there. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it was funny. Oh. When I was going through this for picks, I didn't pick myself for that reason, Quick Draw. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, not tonight, I looked into five wins pick. last year. Yeah, mm, I looked into yep. five wins last season, so I couldn't pick myself for five. It was super hard to pick anyone above four, I thought. Mm -hmm. Priced out of yourself. Yeah. Priced out of yourself, indeed. Um yeah, so really funny, real fun to see how this shakes out. Uh, it's going to be good times. Uh, we'll keep the rounds going. There'll be probably some prizes at the end. I have a few things, to, a few kinks to work out of the spreadsheet. You know, I kind of said that uh, if you were in a match, you couldn't score any points, you know, that sort of a thing. So I haven't uh, haven't added that all into the scoring. I might just may just kind of forget about forget about that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, but, you know, but anyway, uh, even even more cool. Some stats on you know who been who was drafted most. Uh, so most drafted mm -hmm. players. So X Ray uh, was was kind of predicted as a as a top draft pick. Uh, I think I think they may have not were not able to complete the last season and were a very undervalued uh, pick for that reason. Uh, but also Julie July coming in as the second second most drafted player, super value pick right mm -hmm. there. Big Z Aurora, Absolutely. Legend of Elena, uh, our own, not very own, not tonight, uh, mm -hmm. in the in the top five there. 
uh, ranked wise, and then Jay Philippeg, Karen, Nifty, Punch de Leon, rounding out the top 10. So there are your 10 most uh, drafted players. So very cool. Very cool. We will be watching you this season. No pressure. Are you going to share this, uh, no this pressure. data? I will. Is this going to be public information? It's okay, going to be public cool. info. So we're getting the preview right now. I have to iron out some of the uh, scoring deets, some of the scoring deets. Uh, mm. for how points are calculated. So this is preliminary scoring. It's going to shift a little tiny bit. And, you know, some folks uh, registered, I like, I don't I don't know who that is. I'm hoping it's not Dave C. Maybe it is Dave C. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be maybe tricky to figure some of this stuff it's out. suspicious, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that, I think that wraps up our announcements. So uh, I don't know. Unless y'all had anything else, we can dive right into talking Nordic Hexad. Yeah. Let's do it. Cool. Cool, cool. Well, uh, we we generally generally assume some familiarity with the game and its formats on this on the show. Uh, I think this one may be worth just just kind of running through what it is in the ground rules, uh, in case folks are not familiar. Um, but Nordic Hexad or this Hexad format takes um uh, takes some uh, some pages out of triad best of one book at least in my mind uh, how it works is you bring six decks then there is a banning phase so similar to triad uh, each player simultaneously bans one deck from their opponent's lineup uh, that leaves you with five decks from those five decks you choose one of your own to save from banning so it is essentially uh, immune from banning in the in the next round and, uh, and then you go on, ban one more deck from your opponent's remaining four that have not been banned or saved, right? So there are four decks left uh, that you can put potentially ban. You ban one of them. That leaves both players with four decks with which to play exactly three games. So not a best of three. You're going to play three games. Uh, and you can only use each deck once uh, mm -hmm. across those three games. Makes sense. Yeah, it's missing? interesting to me that uh, well, it's, I think it's kind of cool that you have to play all three games, even if there's like a two zero to start. Um, yeah. More games is better. A mm -hmm. um, little bit more of a time commitment, but it's very cool, and I love that um, the third game still matters, and you can't just kind of say, mm -hmm. "Well, I lost the first two, so mm -hmm. I'm out." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, even the third game I find to be sometimes the most interesting, especially as the banning and selection evolves. Throughout the throughout the process, because you'll see after you play the first and second game, seeing what players will choose to save for their third game, gives some insight into their strategy into the match. So it's uh oh, I think we lost Quistra, but uh, gives some insight, into, <laughs> gives some insight into the strategy into the match, which I found, um, which for me I found the most challenging as my first real season in the Nordic Hexad. So a lot of learnings there for me was figuring out which decks to pick, play first, and which decks to save for game three. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a very important uh, note from Murph in the uh, in the chat here, uh, and and absolutely relevant to kind of the topic uh, of the moment. the The standings in the league are not determined by match wins; they're determined by the game wins across the entire season. Right, so there are absolutely there are absolutely times I've seen it each season where you get to the end and somebody just like needs to win one game they don't have to win the match they have to win one game to make it to the playoff round or to not get bumped mm -hmm. down or what have you or somebody needs mm -hmm. to win all three it's not enough to just win two out of three um i think this actually happened to me in the previous season kind of got to the end and like needed to win one win and my opponent needed to win or not my opponent but one of the other players needed my opponent to win all three so there's lots of kind of jockeying uh as you get to the end and it all comes down to games mm-hmm yeah, yeah. My division as well last season. I think at the the bottom of the gold, there was if one. I think if I'd won the last one, I swept the last match, and then my one of my opponents had lost 03, I could maybe snuck into the next gold season. But it, it felt super tight the whole season, which is something I really enjoyed about it. Every match felt relevant, and um, yeah, another just another thing I love about this league. Like the number of players involved and like the divisions they have is such a cool mm -hmm. setup like it really gives you something to 
like to build for you know like it's not like you start over again each season like you probably i think you start at the bottom in the mkfl right you start in the the bottom division essentially and you work your way up and it's got to feel pretty cool to like to win your way up there and earn your spot in the higher leagues right Well, I didn't earn my spot up there, unfortunately. Well, so hopefully, I can, hopefully, I can, hopefully, I can earn my I can earn my place to stay there. <laughs> it's not looking good for me so far, though. Uh, JDG, let's, let's recap. You've, you've played which in division more. are you guys in right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, currently in silver. Currently in silver. JDG, Also in silver. you're in gold, correct? Currently. No silver. You're silver as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is truly the sloppy the sloppy uh, podcast because all of our teammates that are in gold were like nah you guys <laughs> you guys go for it. <laughs> so yeah worth shouting out to both not tonight and Kveld who are not only both in gold uh, but both Mm-hmm. in the same division within gold so some friendly fire there JDG and I in the same division in silver so we will have to be duking it out at some point too and. Uh, Strusel, you and I, S T U and I, this is our third each of our third seasons. How many how many of these have you done, Right. JDG? I think this might be my fourth season, I think. Yeah, I think it's my fourth season. Right on. And uh Right on. and season sixteen was a little bit different in that typically they've done this pr promotion and demotion uh hierarchy of divisions. Uh, so you win a division, you move up, you lose a division, you move down, or kind of finish within the top bottom quadrants, or what have you. Uh, season 16 was a little bit different. It was completely flat uh, with with playoffs. So uh, ST and I were both able to kind of join and and, uh, and have a shot at the top tables uh, from the get-go. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The I think yeah, last season I would say is a for, was my first real taste of the Norik Hexad. Their you know their you know structured leagues, and I think it's really interesting, especially knowing who's in your pod before you even make your deck. Before when you're choosing your decks is also an interesting facet of this league that I feel um, like I'm starting to tap into now. So you can see who your competition is, what type of decks they might be playing, what decks they played historically. There's some information there that you can gain, which is kind of a Another fun, yeah, just another fun, um, another fun a feature of this format and sort of a, a meta can even evolve within your pod, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Right on. ST, I think you have a target on your back here, it looks like. Zach said he's coming for you this season. Let's go. <laughs> right on. Uh, Hey, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I got a huge shout out to Sizox, though. It's a great league. I, I love it. I've spent my third time in, and it's, I can't get enough of it. It's great competition, and I appreciate it be a part of it. Yeah, very fun. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how how the league works, how the format works. Um, and I know that the Nordic Keyforge podcast they recently covered uh, this format and gave some tips and ideas on you know what types of lineups are out there, how you might want to choose choose decks for those lineups. Um, we can we can touch on that too. I think it might be interesting maybe maybe to kind of kick things off. Why don't we? Uh, kind of go go around the table on the folks who have been playing in this league and see if there's anything you want to speak to maybe on how you decided on your lineup or uh, how you kind of approached uh, crafting your six decks for your hex ad. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'll go last. <laughs> how about uh, how about ST? Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so I think um, I can do like my historical thought process through this and then the journey that I've been on through um, throughout my participation from the first and now my third time in this league. The first two times, I feel like I ended up taking an Archon solo approach, which really didn't have much strategy to it. I just took the decks that I was the most familiar with, the decks that I've tested the most, the decks I felt the most comfortable playing with with me into um into my first pod and then that really helped me throughout because I knew my decks I knew how to play against most of the matchups that I would see and I was very comfortable with the banding process but you know and as it went into my second league once it became aware which my favorite decks were which decks I like to play a lot and I think that uh, I was forced to then play decks that I may not have necessarily been most comfortable with or I got put into positions where I had brought in a deck that may not that perhaps I maybe shouldn't have been included and so I got into this uh 
I got into I got I, not necessarily pigeonholed, but I got put into through the banding and selection process, put into situations where I had to save decks or decks that I had brought, which I'm very comfortable with decks that I love, but were not necessarily good or people where my opponents could really strategize against them. And so now going into the next season, I try to pick more wisely. I tried to pick maybe a better set across the board decks that knowing that they're going to ban two, I can bring in four. I can bring one utility deck. And then maybe bring another set of decks that have a similar game plan or have um, a set or set of disruption tools that I'm familiar with to help me really um, try to improve my rates across the board. So that was um, my sort of evolution in my thought process and some of my takeaways from, I guess, uh, my previous seasons and how my thought process evolved into my what I crafted for my new decks for this current season. I'm not sure if you guys were on a similar journey as that, but um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think uh, I I didn't really take a smart approach to my first deck selections, but I'm trying to <laughs> develop some strategy from learning from from you all, learning from others who have a lot more experience with this format. Oh, says says the guy who uh, won uh, season 16. So uh, okay, that's one approach. <laughs> this guy. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, how about, how about uh, JDG? You want to talk about your kind of your lineup? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I had a similar exp uh, experience with ST. Like I think I started in uh, I think season fifteen, so that was the season before uh, they kind of changed uh, better things in season sixteen. And yeah, I think I started off with like choosing my like best decks that I was like most comfortable with, and you know had the best you know win rates on TCO. And I found yeah, I found kind of a similar. Um, experience where a certain decks that would do better on TCO didn't do as well um, in the Nordic Keyforge League and kind of opposite as well. Some decks that didn't do as well on TCO did actually pretty well uh, in a Nordic Keyforge League. Uh, so I think like seasons moving forward, I kind of went kind of for uh, like slightly different strategy where I was thinking of like, um, I guess having certain decks that would do well against certain matchups and kind of having a variety of different decks in my lineup uh, like having like artifact decks or having decks that um that counter um like board based decks like having a quick soul stone deck and then having a deck that counters um decks with very low c um mm -hmm. and also uh finding that some decks are just like kind of uh band bait like people just really don't like them uh, even though mm -hmm. i myself wouldn't think that they're a really strong deck uh so yeah, I think so I think that was kind of my experience. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm a band bait. That was something I, I didn't appreciate, but it took me a, a you know I, I started to get that hint as you know mid might through the last season where you, there were certain decks that there a lot of players were trying to get to fly under the radar by having you know higher sess decks to hopefully get you know taken up by the first band choice so they could save it. But it was a very very interesting strategy. So let me jump in here because last week we were talking about our lessons learned that we each had from mm -hmm. different games. And one of the ones that I talked about was um, always assume that your opponent's better than you and smarter than you. And someone in the chat, it might have been Zach, I forget who exactly like said like a good example of that's band bait. How like band bait as a strategy, if like you don't have a better option, it's fine. But if you do have like other options and you choose to use band bait instead, is that really like helpful? So I'm wondering in this format where you don't have to play every one of your decks, but like, say you have like some 93 SAS deck that, you know, has a bunch of holes in it and you don't really like it that much, but you bring it here just to try to get a ban. Like, how do you guys feel about that in this format? Because you don't ever have to play it, but maybe if you get stuck with it, you're kind of cornered if you don't want to play it. Yeah, I really felt like that's like a double-edged sword, exactly like what the points that you're touching on. You know, there was a deck that I played last season that I liked, but I wasn't necessarily... I didn't necessarily want to play in every match, and it was uh, one of my higher SAS decks. It was, uh, you know, Tenebris. It's, uh, and I felt in the, the first season, it was banned a lot, just because it was my highest SAS deck, and people were a little bit scared of some of the disruption tools in it. But, you know, seeing that even though I had the option to have Tenebris in my lineup, I never played it. I think people were starting to then ban other decks in my selection, or players were starting to ban other decks in my, in my, um, in my Hexad. And then giving me like forcing me to either play it or stick with the three of the other three decks and that was a sort of really precarious situation to be in and so you know that was you know something that i took away from my last season results to moving into this season for my set of six is that you know taking in a deck i would want 
I want to. I would for the decks that I brought. I'd want to be happy playing any of them, and so I didn't want to be in a situation where I was stuck with one deck that I really didn't feel comfortable with. You know, mm-hmm. that was like for me personally. So I did it. It happened to me last season, and that's something I really considered moving into this season. And I ended up switching that deck out for something else. I don't know how how you other how you guys feel about that. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Like, I think it's better if you have the option to choose a deck that you're more comfortable with to go over that than having a bad mm. beat deck that you don't like playing. Like, I think last season I had uh, Sultine Laurent, which was like a double Inferni stack with Eon, Eon Infringers. And I think the fact that it had, like, Infernis, uh kind of served as band bait tool. And it, it did get banned quite a bit because um, it was one of my higher SAS decks. But like, if I if it didn't get banned, then I didn't actually really like playing it. Yeah. So I think I think I would prefer having a deck that I like, that I actually feel comfortable playing, and that I actually like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a weird. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, JT. I was gonna say. I mean, uh, makes makes a lot of sense. And uh, looking at looking at my season, I guess sixteen lineup. Uh, and actually the, my current lineup to, to an extent, I had a, a number of decks in there that not that I would call band bait, but that I was imagining would get banned more than others. Um, yeah. and as I was crafting my lineup, you know, you do some, some play out some scenarios, you know, what, what am I left with after some expected bands? Um, and this really gets to, you know, the different sorts of lineups that you might be bringing, uh, to begin with right and and touching on what was what was mentioned in the nordic uh, podcast that we mentioned earlier you know there's the kind of like these are my six best decks lineup right that's one way you might approach this you know it's kind of the these are all the archon solo choices if i had to just pick six archon solo decks this is what i would bring you know okay this is this is kind of baseline what i have to do better than if i'm going to try and craft a, a smart hex head lineup right and then maybe the next type of strategy is I'm going to bring six decks that are very specialized. They try and do one thing very well. They try and attack one particular through one particular avenue that I can exploit. And then hopefully I've got five or six of these decks. I can ban the two decks in my opponent's lineup that are least susceptible. And hopefully that leaves me with three or four good matchups, right? Uh, and I think those are kind of the, let's call them, uh, let's call them. Those are the maybe the the primary. Uh, if I want to draw an analogy, the primary lineups. If I, uh, if you want to think of them like primary colors, um, and then maybe maybe the other match uh, lineups that you could craft are sort of uh, amalgamations of those two, or 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 take take some notes from either of those two. Um, so I I definitely approached my lineups in this season and the one t- uh, twice before, thinking about how my Think about the decks that I'm left with um, <clears throat> after some uh, supposed bans, and hope trying to trying to have uh, the ability to have sort of maybe not ent- be entirely specialized, but have options for specialization and attacking some very common elements. Um, so I don't think that's quite the same as band bait, but I think that you can look at your six decks and say, okay, these three are most likely to draw first bands or these two are most likely to draw first bands you know i'm gonna let's see pull up some of my stats here um so ban rate i mean uh have some decks that were banned an awful lot i think uh you know aslan was banned in all but two games uh mm-hmm. right and so i i kind of went went in saying like okay i'm probably never playing this deck it just punches really hard and is difficult to deal with um I wouldn't consider it band bait, but I'm often not thinking of it as a deck that I'm going to be playing. I don't know if that does that sound kind of reasonable. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, and then, like, say, like, so that's like the first ban, you know, Aslan is, and then you choose your safe deck, or, you know, say, like, let's say maybe, uh, let's go a different way. Let's say that they ban something besides Aslan for the first one. Do you safe it? Or do you usually expect them to ban it for the second ban and kind of craft your safe around that assumption? So this is a great question and gets a, gets really into uh, really into the theory behind your lineup. 
Um, now, <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I don't know, maybe give away, hopefully not too much, but I approached my, my lineup this season trying to have three or four different sort of mini specialized lineups within this one. So I might consider, say, Aslan as, as maybe a general purpose, purpose punches really hard deck, but it also really punishes some very some kind of typical mass mutation strategies right it's going to be mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be very efficient it's going to generate lots of amber it's going to really prey on decks that uh, uh have no scaling amber control so i may i may look at my opponent's lineup and say oh gosh there's no scaling amber control i have three or four decks that can punish lineups without three or, mm -hmm. without scaling amber control maybe they maybe they get aslan first uh but i'm going to be looking to ban that that one or two deck, the one or two decks in their lineup that have the scaling amber control and then craft my safes and deck choices around exploiting kind of that hole. And similarly to what JDUG was saying about artifact decks, I've got two or three artifact decks, you know, maybe two or three board decks. And you're kind of like, well, I can, I can have these sort of mini specialized micro lineups and then also lean on some of my general purpose decks to kind of bridge the gap. Um, uh, so that's that's really that's really where I, where I was thinking there. But uh, uh, I very very often did did safe this one when I had the opportunity, and interestingly enough, uh, didn't always play it, <laughs> even when safed. <laughs> so it's kind of funny too. Yeah. yeah, I have a deck very similar to this in my lineup, and exactly the same exactly the same thing happened to me most of the season six or the previous season. Um, it's very it's a double brig deck, just like Aslan, but. Just the th the threat of having it and the potential to play it was often good enough to just uh, help me craft a strategy and never have to play the deck in the um, during the actual match itself, which was kind of a, kind of an interesting just to have it looming in the wings, you know. How do you guys feel about artifact control in here? Do you um, pay attention to how many of your decks have artifact control, and do you always make sure to bring a certain amount? I'll let JDG take that one. <laughs> I think the last Amber. my last season I had like almost no artifact control. I think the only deck that had artifact control was uh, Chandra, and it technically doesn't have hard um, hard R. It only has the animator like bouncing death quirks. I think it, I think it depends on your lineup and like which artifacts would counter the decks in your lineup. Because I find with a lot of my decks, uh, they tend to be very action heavy decks. So. Things like a Quixel Stone wouldn't really harm a lot of my decks. Or, uh, for example, Heart. I think most of my decks have a way of handling Heart, uh, whether that be through purging or through exalting. Um, so, I think the only artifact that I really worry about is Eden's Jar, just because, <laughs> like, like having Eden's Jar and just like preventing preventing me from playing like a certain like key card in my uh, decks is pretty harsh, so I think that's the only artifact that I usually um, worry about. And I find that a lot of people don't bring like don't bring like heavy artifact decks like in their entire lineup. But I think it kind of depends who you're facing up against. Yeah, yeah, I'm not scared of artifacts, so quick draw. So I don't, I don't typically bring it. <laughs> <Not much. laughs> I, I bring, I bring some. I, I, I definitely bring, definitely bring some, but. Um, to a JDG's point, I, I definitely I bring a lot of decks with Ian's Jar just because I know it's uh, it draws a lot of bands, and I think that plays into helps well plays into some of the strategy for the decks that um, the lineup that I selected, and um, just be um, a lot of players don't want to play against it, and uh, if they don't have the artifact control, it can really really throw on um, thwart lots of game plans. How many Jar decks are in your lineup, SD? My lineup. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm running two jar decks, mm -hmm. so you can ban both of them if you like. But interesting, you know, seamstress is there, you know. <laughs> like a dare. <laughs> yeah. like a dare. And worth yeah. noting too that um, that in this league you are limited to one heart of the forest deck uh, per lineup. Mm. Yep. So I you didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so. and and one Genka deck too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's oh, the, there's kind of the some restrictions there you can play as many quixel decks as you like as many jars as you like um, but those two are limited mm -hmm. yeah once jdg wins the gold league with his quixel stones they're gonna change your role for that <laughs> <laughs> well now i have uh, two quixel decks in my lineup <laughs> i um i played a heart deck last season 
it got almost zero bands, um, which <laughs> really surprised me. I was I was sort of an yeah. Gosh, you're gonna make me sound sound like a bad player here, but I was almost almost thinking of it as band bait, you know, almost. Uh, um, uh, I was definitely thinking of it as band bait. <laughs> um, if I ever yeah. joined this league, I'm gonna make them uh, limit whirlpool to one per lineup. To, to one per lineup. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. The uh, the Nordic players they have no fear for heart. Um, no fear for heart. No but fear for uh, heart. hopefully we can. Be- we can make them uh, we'll ban Curiosaurus. I am running four Curiosaurus decks, so wow, we'll wow. see. Oh wow. man, that sounds awesome! <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, personal favorite, but uh, me, me definitely too. Some spice. Yeah. yeah, and now in stereo as well. Who maybe mm-hmm. he'll join us on this show next month? Um, yeah, also huge fans of Curiosaurus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So uh, I had a question as someone who's not familiar with this. Like, I'm obviously more familiar with Triad. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys can like compare and contrast this format with Triad because it does like, resemble it as like JT was talking about earlier. Um, what do you guys see as like the biggest differences with this, with Triad? And does it make a difference if it's like Triad BO3 or Triad Best of 1? Hmm. I, th- I think with Triad Best of 3, it the banning and deck selection, deck selection process is much simpler because all mm-hmm. you need to do is win two games with your remaining deck. So if there's one deck that's weak to two of your remaining decks, then you've kind of got the match set for you. Um, and if you contrast this with uh, the Nordic Keep, like uh, Nordic Hexad or Triad Best of One, um, like the fact that you aren't playing with the same deck twice kind of makes it a bit more complicated in terms of um, Choosing which deck to play first and which deck to play second and third. Yeah, and I think it also makes the the lineup strategy more complex as well. Just having the the opportunity of six and then being left with four um, decks at the end. Um, yeah, I think that there's definitely more flexibility there than a regular hex a regular triad lineup, which I like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If I was going to say the biggest difference between best of three and, and Hexad, or even best of one for that matter, is the fact that you don't have to play every single deck. Uh, and that mm-hmm. really creates a lot of room to maneuver and it takes a lot of pressure off of each of your decks to be kind of a, a monster in their own right. So you can have a deck in your Hexad or your tried best of one lineup that is meant to be a role player and come in and and hit in like uh, like special teams, right? And and like come in when the circumstance is right, and take down the monster. You know, you slay you slay the you slay the monster with your sixty five Sath deck because it's like just the right one for that um, for that matchup. But you don't have to play it every time, and it has to win, right? So you can you can really get creative and and craft these lineups that are. I I don't want to repeat myself too much, but you know like. Uh, uh, like a, some of their strengths rather than defined by the weakest link. Um, and that's that's really appealing to me for this format. Um, the fact, too, that you don't need to continue playing with the deck after it's lost uh, contributes to that. So, again, mm-hmm. you're not kind of limited by your weakest link trying to trying to have the, the deck that has three bad matchups get lucky so that you can move on and, and have a shot at winning the matchup is huge. Um yeah, so I, I don't know. I I see, I see best of one triad as a strict improvement. I think we had said this as a hot take. This was uh, Karen's hot take over triad best of three, at least in terms of you know f- forces that are good for the game and and good for kind of uh, this this type of uh, match. Not that triad best of three is bad by any means. Just that I think they I, I enjoy that the dynamic a little bit better, and I see hexad as kind of a. Uh, big brother evolution sort of thing, if you will, of best of three, our best of one triad. Mm, I've never had the opportunity to play best of one triad. Can you guys elaborate a little bit more on, on how that game, how it flows? So what's uh, what that looks I actually, like? I did it a few weeks ago. Um, Joker over in the Vault Keepers um, server, he hosted a best of one triad um, event one night, a few nights ago, a few Fridays ago. And, uh, I really liked it. He was, um, I think it was like the day before the announcement of like the changed formats. We did this. Um, and I think I'm trying to like go back in my brain what it was like. So 
you know, I brought three solid decks. My best deck was banned, I think, twice out of three games, or twice out of four games. Um, I managed to play with it one of the other times and, and won with it pretty well. Um, but I also kind of went to a similar strategy you guys were talking about, where you have like this utility deck in a triad best of three. Uh, sorry, triad best of one. In a triad best of three, you can't quite do that, because if that utility deck gets a bad matchup, then you're just kind of out of luck in a best of three. Mm -hmm. But in a best of one, I allowed myself to do that, and it really paid off because um, I didn't play it one time in one of the games that I had it available, or two of the games. But then there was another one when I chose a ban from my opponent, and then I thought about the other two they had left, and I thought, yeah, this is a pretty good niche for this here, and I went with it, and I won with it. Um, so it kind of had that same feel you guys have been talking about, how you, you were able to have that toolbox deck in a best of one that you can't really have in a best of three. Mm -hmm. This was my my biggest downfall in the previous season. Uh, so season, what are we in? We're in 18 right now? Yes. So yeah. season 17 uh, was not a great great season for the Russell brothers, not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but my, uh, my, I think my biggest, uh, my, I have my lineup here, lots of excellent decks in this lineup. All these decks were excellent. Um, uh, I did not make great use of my utility decks. Uh, so th I have this one deck, uh, uh, Porta Drain, which had some of the best results over the course of the season once I was convinced myself to play it, even though it struggles the most out of these six in um, in kind of open mm. competitive uh, TCO, right? So if you looked at the open competitive TCO rates for this deck, not not amazing, but within uh, the matchups that I the matchups and the uh, the bannings that I was able to craft, like it was a linchpin of the uh of the lineup um so really really a deck that i kind of undervalued in the beginning of the season and didn't didn't appreciate fully towards till towards the end um and you know that compounded with <laughs> another another kind of rookie mistake which was that i had uh uh very well, similar slide, what's, what's that very similar weaknesses uh <laughs> very similar weaknesses <laughs> across all the other decks. So I was putting myself in a position where I had like this, uh, uh, like really, really easy lineup to attack, even though in maybe if, if these were just kind of Archon solo decks, they'd all be, you know, formidable. Um, but in, uh, in a situation like this, where I was trying to present like a, more of a team lineup strategy, I was just kind of leaving myself vulnerable and then did not really like, uh, did not really, make the most use out of those utility decks, which I put in for that purpose. Yeah, that that's a good point. But um, I think that's something also I, I, I took away from last season and wanted to include into this season was just the idea of having a utility deck at my disposal to pick if I need to throughout, um, depending on the matchups. And so taking away, like, you know, moving back to the kind of idea of having a big SAS deck or a band base, so taking that deck necessarily out of my, out of my, triad out of my uh, my lineup and putting in a utility deck i think will help me across a run even though it may not serve as a band bait it might also it might just give me that flexibility i need when i'm getting into a tight spots during um during in some matchups and so that's something i'm hopeful i can also make use of this season as well i got another strategy question for you guys and this is something that i've seen some talk about um when you you get your safe deck, um, your second choice. After you ban something, you save something. Um, when do you play it? Because if you wait until like the third game, you kind of like tip your hand, right? Indeed. Uh, yeah. It's a very interesting question. And I think I see most folks playing their, their safe deck second. Uh, it just seems to be, be a very common thing. I had a very, very cool matchup uh, already in this season where uh, I did safe Aslan. And I think when I safed it, um, it had the most favorable matchups of the decks that I had available. Um, my opponent after the match said, yeah, that was going to be my next ban. Uh, probably was in contention, or was even in contention for ban number one. I did not end up playing it throughout, um, throughout the match. Uh, so I was, I was hoping to play it third it had a bad matchup and I kind of went through the whole series thinking that 
okay, right now, until the bad matchup gets flushed out, it has more value as like uh, as a threat than than kind of winning a game, you know. Uh, so I, it's interesting. I think the answer is unfortunately it depends. Most people do it second, but uh, for the reason that that you just mentioned, that you feel like you're being a little bit transparent if you leave it to third, and you feel like you've left something on the table if you run it out first. Um, but I think you really have to. Uh, I think you really have to consider, you know, the the, the matchups that are still left to be played, and it's a shifting. It's a mm-hmm. shifting kind of. Uh, shifting battlefield as it were i don't know have you have you guys ever come into situations where you didn't end up playing your safe deck or you do you tend to find yourself playing it in the same slot each time uh i end up playing so i was playing it as you know as jt noted as in the second match a lot of my match a lot of my game or matches when that would ban one deck i would save like a true loser like um a naslin like deck and then I would have this deck, and they would end up saving a deck with, let's say, scaling Amber Control. And so they're trying to now, they're playing this match of trying to, we're playing this game of when, when do we, when do we play True Loser? Is it going to be game one, and then, or is it going to be game two? And I was most notably defaulting to game two, and I was losing a lot of those matches because I was auto auto pick playing my save deck in match two. And then what I found was that if I could start. P- by playing more of these mind games throughout the match, it actually served me a lot better. And especially even not playing it at all was very helpful. I'd end up getting to game three, and then knowing that which deck my opponent needs to select just in case I do bring, you know, a Naslan like deck to the table, I can then instead have the pick between do I actually want to play this deck or do I play the utility deck that I've saved that hopefully try to counter the, um, the deck that they're, you know, trying to use to take down um, like an Aslan like deck. So I thought that um so it it definitely yeah being more flexible in when to play these decks I think brings another element to this hex that that I didn't appreciate in the last season that I can that um were some lessons learned for me moving into this season. How about you, JDG? Do you uh do you tend to play your safe deck in the same spot each time, or do you move it around? I think I move it around. I think it depends. Like if it has. Um, like if I'm trying to get a certain matchup, like let's say a quick Chandra, a quick Soulstone deck against uh, some um, some of their other decks uh, that are weak to it, but I know that there's bad matchup for it, I might start with my safe deck if I know it, like um, if it will do well against most of the other decks, because I, I usually save uh, like an all around deck that usually does pretty well against most matchups, so I might start off with that first just to see what they decide to pick um if it's a safe matchup uh but sometimes i do try to save it last so it kind of yeah it kind of depends on uh the matchup and what your opponent is bringing but you're not afraid of playing at game three and having them like being able to predict that that's what you're going to play if i well if i know that my safe deck does well against all of the decks then there isn't really a concern for that it's only if it has a weakness against some of their decks where I might consider maybe playing it first. Uh, but like also like sometimes they might play that like yeah, there's definitely mind games where they like if I choose to play my safe deck first, they might predict that and choose a bad matchup for it. So it is kind of tricky deciding which when to play it. So now you guys have to do the exact opposite next match you play. So, ST, you got to play your safe deck first. JD, you got to play your safe deck second. And then I guess JT, you got to just never play your safe deck. Is that right? I, I, I guess. But now, now I'm being predictable. I think the the true like far right of the bell curve uh, play is to just randomly decide all of the things uh, at each point along the way. You know? Maximum chaos. I like it. Maximum chaos, indeed. Actually, it's it's not a bad strategy if you like just straight up tell them like I am literally rolling a die to see when I play my safe deck, mm-hmm. just and just so they can't like try to game you. You guys ever played a game called Skull and Roses? I think it's probably got a few different names, but you basically get a deck of cards and um, you have some red cards and you have some black cards, and everybody gets uh, I think they start with a hand of one red and three black, and you choose one of your cards to put out and then mm. the object of the game is just to go around and select only black cards 
So if somebody has a red card, it's like a bomb and you lose and you know, you don't want to reveal red cards. And then as you're playing this game, this is kind of a long story, but it is relevant, I promise. You're playing this game <laughs> and uh, you notice patterns in people where like yeah. this person always puts out a black card. This person mm. always puts out a red card. There are some people who play this game who literally do not look at what they put out and they just shuffle it in front of everyone else and they throw it out there just because they don't want you to have that predictability with them. And that's kind of what you're suggesting here, JT, perhaps, is to like make sure it's known and make it clear that you like they cannot predict which ones you cannot be gamed and maybe even that alone is a mind game that alone the mind games within mind games i love it you know uh one of my <laughs> matchups last season uh shout out to hydro for crushing me last season um was against hydro and i i went full try hard on my preparation uh last season and i i like game planned out all of the bands contingencies the deck selections and the matchups i'd be left with and when I was planning for Hydro, a big factor in my criteria was, and I don't even know if this was part of their thinking or not, but a big factor in my criteria was they're not going to want to be predictable. <laughs> and I was <laughs> I was banking on them making different uh, deck selections than they did in the previous <laughs> season. Uh, I got the matchups I wanted, still got crushed. But what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and you lost a low curve, is that right? That I lost. Ah, oh, did I didn't get I didn't lose the low curve. I don't I didn't have the pleasure of playing the low curve this time. But mm. I remember um, I lined up Spike Blaster with their uh, with Hydro's rush deck, the like Library Axis rush deck with no Amber Control, and I was like, this is the matchup I wanted. I uh, feeling great about it. Got smacked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what are you going to do? Great player, good decks, only so much you can do. Um, yeah. Random all the time. <laughs> That's the takeaway. Roll the die. Roll the die. Just let fate decide. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not wrong. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it pans out for me this season. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see. From the Sloppy Lab work, we have, I think, Three people in silver and two in gold. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I believe that's right. You are not playing. Stereo is not playing. And I don't believe Crusader is playing, though. He, he may be under an alternate account or something. I'm, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. <laughs> he's he's shifty like that. You never know. Very shifty. Mm -hmm. For all we know, JDG could really be Crusader. <laughs> I mean, how would we know otherwise? <laughs> Have you ever seen them both in I the mean... same room? <laughs> <laughs> We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> um, do you guys have any other um, like strategy aspects of the Hexad that you want to bring up that we haven't talked about yet? The only other thing I wanted to touch on, and uh, we, we did a little bit, but uh, I think you had kind of asked at one point, and maybe it was on our notes or maybe it was just on, on the, the team server, you know, was are there decks you'd bring to Hexad that you wouldn't bring to Open Archon? Um, yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I do feel like we touched on that a little bit, especially if you're trying to uh, craft this specialized lineup. Um, you know, looking at my lineup here, um, Brickblade, I, I love this deck. It punches really hard. It can high roll amazingly, um, but it has lots of holes, or at least it has some glaring holes, right? And if you can, uh, if you can make some critical bands. Right, and there is not an overwhelming number of decks on the other side, then it's just going to it would be a very strong, uh, strong deck in the remaining among the remaining four. Um, but you, it's maybe not a deck you'd take to open Archon if you have other options. I mean, you could take it and hope to dodge the bad matchups, um, but it's going to have some bad matchups. You know, uh, you're you're really aiming to play this double punctuated equilibrium. You know, seeing first turn auto encoder is just really sad times. Uh, uh, you know, you have mm -hmm. very low low board control. So there are, there are holes, but there are things that you can craft around, and it can be part of this larger picture that that you can orient towards. So I mean, uh, looking at looking at its stats, um, looking at its stats, uh, I mean, it's it's winning the majority of the time that it gets played, um, but it's not getting played in the matchups where it's going to be poor i mean ideally right um which i don't think you'd see the same percentage the same win percentage if you were taking this to a vault tour and just trying to grind it through you know day one day two i think you'd you'd, you'd see a much lower number yeah 
I brought a deck last season like that. Um, I think uh, Green Hive Warden. I don't know if you can pull it up, Justin, but it has a the deck strategy is it plays a long game. It wants to build up a Voltron like Doctor Vroctor, so you can play pretty much any card from your discard pile. It has a couple Teresas that you can load onto it, so you can then use them in any house. But you have to build up to this big turn when you craft this large creature and this ultimate end up strategy. Um, uh, end board, board um, end state, um, but um, it really relies a lot because of that. Pl- relying on a card like Mechabui or some of these key artifacts in the in the deck itself. And if I'm playing decks that can also take advantage of these artifacts, then it's very very hard for it to win. Or if it's also playing decks that can really counter or have selective artifact removal, like that can particularly purge the rooftop laboratory, it's problematic. So it, I end up. I like having it here as a utility deck. It has lots of great board control. has lots of good amp control. It has a, a really nice end game strategy. But if I took it to an open Archon event, it would may not fare very well um, because there are definitely lots of game plans that can really hurt it, especially in Lava and Furnace-like strategies can really just prey on a deck like this, and it can be um, pretty, tra- pretty challenging. So I like to have it as an option, but I don't uh, necessarily want to play in every matchup. Yeah. I can't remember if we asked this too. Maybe this is an obvious question, but like the other side of this question here, um, are there any decks that you guys have encountered where it is good enough for Archon and it's a great Archon caliber deck, but you would not bring it to the Hex Ed? Mm-hmm. I'm guessing the answer is no. It's interesting. I, I'm, I was going to say yes. Uh, I don't know, JDG, do you have any anything there that comes to mind? I'm still crafting my answer. I uh, don't think so. I think most of my Archon decks I would bring to Hexad. So I I, I think I shared this with, with you all originally. Um, I started with a list of, I think, 10, 10 potential decks for this season. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe it was 11, maybe it was 9, I can't quite remember. And ended up trimming down to these six that that were uh, here. No, not here, but here. Um, so these six from the ten, some of the some of the trim decks were decks that I would have been more likely to take to Archon Solo, um, but uh, maybe weren't my one or two best Archon Solo decks, if you will. And I thought that the lineup as a whole was stronger with some of the more specialized decks uh, in there instead of another one. Now, that being said, I think if you're going to take decks with holes, it is it is super important to have these well-rounded decks to anchor the lineup, right? You, you want to have things that you can mm-hmm. save. You want to have things that you can fall back on and not feel like you're in a corner when you get down to the last two or three decks. Um, uh, uh, and yeah. I don't know. Uh, the, the one that really comes to mind for me is uh, is the combo grieve that I ended up cutting. He slices the gully. Um, this was probably like go to archon deck for me for a while. It just has like you know normal coda heist things, lots of steel, lots of rush, and maybe it's a little bit more suspect in kind of infernus meta. Um, but this was the one that kind of came to mind as like this is a pretty pretty solid choice for open archon. Um, but didn't make it into the into the hex head lineup this time, um, just because of the, what what the lineup wanted. Yeah, there was a deck that in my that I had in the previous two seasons that I ended up cutting. That I think I would have taken it with open archon. I was pulling. I had previously I had Tenebris in my lineup, and I think with more practice and more familiarity of the deck, I would be happy to take it to an open archon event. But I found myself, when having the opportunity to play it, not using it and going with another deck, which was another reason why I ended up taking it out. But mainly it's just due to I wasn't, I'm not very entirely comfortable with the deck yet into a lot of different types of strategies. But I think, um, but yeah, I think it's just, it's a great, it's a solid deck that I would end up taking to an Archon event. But, um, but yeah, I ended up cutting it. And so in favor of a, a more utility deck in this season or a deck that I at least had more tools I was more familiar and comfortable with. So, um, but yeah. So it sounds like you guys, that was maybe a decision based on you having other really good options, but like mm. you'd still be satisfied to take that deck, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
I, I would be happy to take that deck. I think though, and this is a this is a point that they hit uh, hard in the uh, in the Nordic Keyforge podcast, uh, which was uh, you know Zeramis there was saying for folks that have uh, not a not a whale of a collection, but a, a decent number of decks to choose from. Um, uh, Zeramis was suggesting that they 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 steer towards the specialized uh, lineup versus my six best Archon decks. Um, and mm-hmm. I absolutely did see in gold and silver uh, and, and, and bronze. I'm sure I wasn't looking at bronze, though. I, I know a few folks. Uh, I know of a few folks there. I want to say who would fall into this category, um, who were bringing specialized decks. You know, maybe they want five or six rush decks, and so you know you'd see decks rated in the in the in the mid to high 60s, but with expected amber, you know, around 35. Uh, and maybe uh, I, I I I can't say for absolute certain, but I I would not be surprised if they had uh, stronger open archon contenders, if not uh, uh, certain certainly higher SAS rated decks, if not stronger open arc open archon contenders. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, um, but yeah, I th- I think leaning into that specialized lineup can steer you away from. Um, this open arc on contenders, even if you don't have a super deep collection, and you may may be better off that way. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. All right. So we're hitting about on an hour, which is about when we um, when I start getting into a hand and brain game. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when that was half an hour? <laughs> that was our that was our goal originally, and then you and I just kept talking way too much. <laughs> Still the goal. We're just not bad at hitting it, you know. <laughs> so um we have four of us here tonight, which is awesome for hand and brain, because we're gonna pit two of us against the other two. And uh, of course, it, you know, when given the opportunity we have to have the Russells pitted against each other. Um <laughs> And just a, a recap on the hand and brain, JDG. I don't think you've joined us for a hand and brain game before. Um, the brain is the owner of the deck. They will be choosing uh, which house to choose, which house to play each turn. And then the hand is the other player who will be choosing which cards to play and how to play through the entire turn. Um, the brain cannot help the hand during the game. Uh, they can just choose the house, and the the hand has to make the right decisions. Uh, and then in your off turn, talk more about like what you did, and the brain can kind of tell you why you were wrong or why that was a play they maybe wouldn't have thought of. Um, and my favorite aspect of how we've been playing this is that um, the hand has obviously not, like, never played the deck before. Um, so the brain knows what they should do in the situation, but all they can do is pick the house. Um, so we're going to have JT Russell and ST Russell um, do a simulated hex ad here with the banning phases, and we're just going to play one of the games. Um, and then uh, who am I going to play with? I'm going to play with one of you guys and then JDG with the other. He's going to fight over JDG because he's more experienced in this format. I want you, Quick Draw. Let's do it. All right. I love it. <laughs> All right, JDG. Um, look, I think these chumps down. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you guys have your um, your your six hex ad, your six deck hex ad ready? Ooh, yeah. Okay. So, got the uh, sloppy demo. Sloppy demo. Yeah, we have the sloppy demo test game up here. Um, Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, since you all can see my screen, and I think it would be more fun if uh, JDG and I had to have a little, gotta have a little banter on the um, <clears throat> banning, bannings and safes. Why don't, why don't you all? I don't know. You can use hand signals, smoke signals, or what have you. Make a ban, and then we'll we'll hash it out. Uh, or if you want to just have it all all in the open, that's cool too. Uh, I don't know any of your decks. So I'm comfortable leaving you two to, to duke it out head to head. Mm. Okay. Ugh. All right. Interesting. So do, you, do you have it up on your screen as well, ST? I do. Right? Yeah. Do you okay. want me, hold on, let me I can I share my screen. I don't think you have to share it, but I nope. was just, okay. you know, I, I haven't seen this tool really. Um, I've seen mm. it work in action a little bit. Um, but not in detail. So you guys are simultaneously making your first ban, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, right. it, it'll it inform you guys each which one has been banned, and then you'll simultaneously and secretly make your safe deck. Um, and so you're kind of going back and forth and seeing 
the opponent's decision and how that might influence what you're going to say for what you're going to ban next. Yeah, that's right. And uh, there's a there's a lot of scary decks that I want to ban. So this is a tough tough <laughs> choice. Well, let's say, all right, quick draw. What do you think? Do we do we hate Quetzalstone more than we hate Brig or Control Jar? Alicia. Jar is pretty pretty troublesome. I also yeah. just like Quixelstone. And you know what? JDG being a Quixel pro, yeah. I think maybe that's a smart choice to, to yeah. we're on this we're on, we're on the same wavelength. And also we have a lot of curious decks that wants to load Amber on creatures. So that's probably yeah. the most fearful deck at the moment. All right. So we're no stealth warper for you, JT. Stealth Warper, I actually know that deck too. That is a good band. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay, so JDG, I guess we're making a ban here. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with any or any of these decks, really. Uh, mm, no. You could roll a die. What do you think? Go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Eden. Maximum chaos. Are you worried about Eden Star? Yeah, the Jar is a good ban. Uh, so G G that Solomon me dreams about dwarves has a has a Jar. Um, Mid turn Blake seamstress. Uh, we got to see on the stream last week so i might just go ahead and ban that one so we don't we don't end up playing a game with it again <laughs> maybe, maybe, you get, maybe you could get revenge on it this week since it came out last week. i'm like tr trying not to give away all the uh, all the, the 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 playbook for for banning and sc wrestle two while we're at it yeah <laughs> As I'm the science is already been sloppy is, since you already know the band that we we're making. Oh yeah, this is not yeah. my eighty-eight SAS random access archive deck, please. No. So let's see. This one is there another? I think so. G has a jar. Gerlock, I don't think has a jar. It's got a couple in furnace. It has a jar. It's got a jar. Okay, so mm -hmm. Gerlock has a jar as well. G has a jar. Uh, Hartley does not. Truly, there's just not. Blake does not. There's only two jar decks in your lineup currently. No jar here. Chrysanthemum, no jar. Okay, so for banning a jar deck, we're between G and Gerlock. <clears throat> Let me close these up. They're both fine, fine choices for uh, for bans. G also has him for Captura and Curiosaurus. Captura, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I actually played both of these. You know, uh, a while back I was testing out some decks to borrow for a Vault Keeper event, and I mm. tested out both of these. Um, perhaps an unfair advantage since I know the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Just ban it. Yeah, we'll see if it helps you. Yeah, I think I gotta check my record on these. My record's probably like one in five. I didn't end up playing them. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, got a preference, JDG, between these two? Mm, can I see G again? Yes. Here is G. Are we, are we worried about uh, Curia and Amphora, or? It is pretty. It is pretty worrisome. Um... And actually, to be to be totally transparent, I think this was my first ban when we when we met each other in the semis of season sixteen. I banned this deck first, so I was worried about it then. Still worried about it now, I guess. I think it's a reasonable ban. Mm. Let's go with it. Okay, no G for you. Oh look, they banned Stealth Warper. Mm. No. <laughs> um. Mm. All right. So. Safe deck. I'm. I'm going to defer to you. All right, I feel what, like we don't have to play like, the safe deck here, right? Like <clears throat> that's true. Just... I'm going to give you a, a little flavor for each one, and then we can see wh whichever one strikes your fancy. We'll save that one. Um, Hartley is like board vomit. It's gonna it's gonna play almost every house every turn once it gets on the table. Um, Chrysanthemum is a, a combo deck. It's gonna. Uh, Blake is just utility and control, and True Loser is a double brig. So, which one of those tickles your fancy? Combo. Combo it is. Right, I love combo. I don't know what combo this is, but I like combos. 
<laughs> oh, it's a spicy one. Oh, the spicy, spicy pizza is, combo? Is that what they are? It's quite triumphant. All right, JDG. Uh, deck. I, think I, I don't think I have to sell you on this deck. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's what I was looking at. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'll be fine saving this. Nice. After my own heart. Nothing, yeah. nothing... Oh, uh, boo. Nothing <laughs> makes us happier than animator transporter platform. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very happy. Quite happy. Quite happy. All right. Back to banning. All right. Quick draw. We think in. Oof. I don't see his lineup, but I'm thinking, so there's a... It's got uh, Brickblade was the deck we saw with the double punks. Um, yep, okay, not Cell afraid Warden, of that. Yeah, Cell Warden's like utility control. Oh, uh, Cell Warden, um, I remember solid, okay. And then yeah. Aslan is the brig, double brig. Yep, um, and then and then he I, has the uh, Might Makes Right deck, the new I, edition. I, I know what I would go with here. What would you like? I, I would, default to you. personally, I would, I would ban Aslan. Yeah, I was thinking the same. Okay. I'm not afraid of Brickblade. Bring on Brickblade. <laughs> Me either. Let's do it. Okay. So we still have a we still have a jar deck that we could ban. Um there's also Double Brig, uh this creature spawn and um some of a mid rangey uh controlish deck in Blake. Mm, I mean, we could ban the other Eden Shard deck. Because uh, T-Zager, does it, I don't think has... Oh, it has Animator as R, but... Yeah, has the Animator. We don't have tons of other... I mean, it has an Eden Shard itself, too. So. It does. Okay, so we'll, that's, I'm good with that. I don't I don't fancy playing against Skurlock. Okay. All right. Cool. So, um, again, I'm going to defer to UST for the deck choice here as the brain. Hmm. So nice. This will be interesting. Let's, Let's say this this one we might get too much info if we uh, if we get the table talk. How about how about you and I, ST, just pick the decks for a game order, and then okay. we'll put in dummy scores, and then from the three games, we'll pick the most interesting one to play. Deal. Does that make sense? Okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Or a or a JDG two. If there's a deck you particularly want to make sure gets in, uh, you can let me know, and we uh, we can uh, put that one in there too. So, and at this point in the like the hexad selection process, are you guys choosing a deck for game one, and then you play game one, and then you choose a deck for game two? Is that how it works? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you got to finish game one, go into your your selection for game two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me know when you have a deck selected. Uh, selected the ST. All right, I have a deck selected. Okay. Going with Lorian. Going with Lorian. Nice. Ooh, Lorian versus Hartley. That is going to be uh, a quick game. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, let's, we'll see how it goes. Unfortunately yeah. for you, you lost 3 2. Oh. <laughs> All right, so now. <laughs> so now. <laughs> so now we're going nah, okay. for game two. Yep. Mm hmm. Hmm. All right. Let's select, I selected a game for game two. All right. So, guarantee you here, JDG, that under normal circumstances, he would go with Seamstress, but he didn't because we just talked about it. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Lighthouse Dock. Oh, you always got to pick your safe deck in game two, right? 
Okay, True Loser versus Lighthouse. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Uh, we'll give you this one. Three, two. Three, two. All right. Okay, cool. All right. So let us know when you have your deck selected. I mean, uh, when seems, I mean, uh, when you have your deck selected. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I selected my deck for game three. Okay. So we're going to play brick blade versus seamstress. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. So chrysanthemum versus brick blade. That is interesting. That is interesting. Interesting matchup. So we have, I got a, I got to pull up these decks so I know what I'm getting myself into here. Yeah, so we have three yeah, matchups uh, to choose from. Hartley versus um, Lorian. So Hartley is all efficiency, spamming creatures, not much amber control if I'm remembering it right. Um, mm -hmm. Lorian is much of the same with some key cheats in there. Uh, so then we have True Loser in game two, which is the Brig combo against our control. Um, promises to be a, a spicy, grindy match, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have the jar, though you have shark, um, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then game three, brick blade is creature spam, double punctuated equilibrium, triple Kirby uh, against chrysanthemum, which is going to make a decent board to look to combo out, and notably uh, has things like city state. When our board, when our board wipes our axiom is axiom, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Although my board wipe is also Axiom, which makes for an interesting matchup. <laughs> it does, it does. So I guess, uh, does any of those matchups in particular appeal to you, uh, quick to RGDG? I think it's a lot for me to analyze to say. So I, I will again defer to you guys here for the choice yeah. of what you think will be the best. Mm. All right. All right, JT. What do you think? Which much which matchup seems the spiciest to you? There we go. I'm personally leaning towards either game one or game three would be quite interesting, but um, I'm happy to happy to do game two, if you if if that's uh, what you want to do. You sound like a man who doesn't want to get smacked around in game two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's let's do game one. It's, we've already gone kind of long here. Let's go right for cool. the the blood, the sharp matchup. Yeah. All right. So, um, JDG, I'm gonna start a game for us, and I'm gonna load uh, Empiricist Hartley for game one, and you're going to load. Which what was, what was what was the game one deck, JT? So we had Lorian Ilpuro, Ministro. Okay. Del. Okay. So. Might be easiest if I if I uh, if I join. You have to dictate the actions though to me. So I, that that would be easier. Or, or no no. Uh, actually yeah, JDG, you make the game. I'll join. Just make sure that whoever makes the game has yeah. hands revealed. Mm -hmm. You can make the game. So show hands. Um, game is up password is sloppy so jdg you join it and then st and jt just uh join as watchers so you can tell us what to do and i will drop a link to the deck okay I'm just gonna load the, the deck um yeah uh, drop a right, link so in the chat if that's helpful <clears throat> with um the hands shown to spectators um obviously st will not be looking at um, our opponent's hands, and JT will not be looking at uh, my hand. Um, and then I think um, we're safe to... Now, we probably should um, turn off the uh, the screen viewing that JDG and I are doing, so we don't see what, J, uh, what uh, JT's looking at here. Ooh, good question. It's going to mess up our video here. One second. No, it shouldn't. You can keep, you keep sharing. Um, to show everyone else what you're looking at, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, but JDG and I should not be cheating and peeking at it. Ideally, no. Ideally. All right. <laughs> Ideally, right. Yeah. All right. Honorable lab workers. <laughs> All right. So let's make sure we pick the right decks here. So we've got Lurian and we've got 
Uh, Empiricist Hartley. Okay. All right, so I'm going to take a look here at what um, what I'm dealing with. I've got a Val Jericho, 22 creatures. Um, the Eric is like a little low for an 84 Saz ST, like 5.0 Amber control, 11 creature control, only an 18 expected. Um, but got some really good efficiency high novella yeah. um and what are we we are up against Lugorian, which is a gang or not deck i believe yeah double gang or not coward's end three standardized um all right i'm gonna be i'm gonna be counting this for the uh the swindle house badges too if uh if we knock any of those brobnar <laughs> Brobnar uh, quests off, for sure. But uh, what are the what are the Brobnar quests? I don't think I have. Uh, so one of them is to rule of six, uh, the gang or not combo. Uh, there's one to use cowards end to blow up the opposing board and leaving all of yours with at least creature, three creatures. Uh, there's like a six fights one. So there's some options. We'll see. We'll see. But I don't want to yeah, influence. Talk about these. Talk about the badges. I don't. I don't know about the badges. Oh, it's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Uh, so the Swindle folks uh, have have put up some uh, kind of side quests. So uh, type things. So each. I think the Brobnar is the first. I think. I don't know if there's the, the second house has been announced yet, but uh, there's a series of uh, goals um, that you can try to accomp try to achieve, uh, and and work your way towards earning a house badge. So the first one is the house of Brobnar and the goals are things like, yeah, yeah rule of six gang or not, you know, uh, uh, forge with might makes right your third key flex for six or more, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so all of these things, you take a screenshot of yourself doing it and post it in the channel. And if you do all the things you, uh, you get the honors. Uh, so I'm uh, gradually working my way up to the, uh, the Brobnar badge, chopping those things nice. off. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, quick question for both of you as a as a new new brain. What's the uh, what is what's like the rules for being the brain in this matchup? So not much. Uh, shouldn't yep. give that much away of much way much way of strategy to the hand, or just I'm just given uh, input on house and that's it, right? So you try not to give any hints. Um, choose mm. the house each turn, and then after I butcher the turn, you tell me everything I did wrong. Oh, okay. I'm you definitely will butcher any of these turns, promise you. It's gonna be a <laughs> this is gonna be a great match. <laughs> All right, let's see. But I was gonna say, yeah, the um the amber control does look like quick drop, but the triple quin kin can can be very helpful in this match. Yeah, there's only one overlapping house here, so that's good for the kin can. Mm -hmm. Um he's got a lot less amber control than I do. He's just got a grok and a Mars needs amber, so I got to make sure to not keep any damaged creatures on the board. Um, thankfully, it's mm -hmm. a lot of small creatures until I play the fittest. But um, yeah, something something to keep an eye out for. Yeah, you, uh, you just gonna leave cowards around? You only want cowards? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Maybe no cowards in Hartley, buddy. No cowards in um, Hartley. It's either who chooses a, oh. the mulligan. Does the hand or the brain choose? The brain chooses mm -hmm. mulligans. Yep. And I don't okay. know if I've, so, I may have been disconnected. I'll go redraw. I was disconnected as well. Okay. Back in. Back in. All right. Hmm. Let's let's throw oh. this one back, JDG. Let's mulligan this one. Again. Okay. Well, so the brain gets to select um, mulligans, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. well, let's toss this one back too. I'm really liking our uh, our board control in this matchup. I think that's going to be hopefully hopefully real helpful, but we'll see. Hartley really does keep spamming out creatures. Interesting. All right. So, uh, which house are you thinking? Let's go Mars first here. Mars, yeah. Ooh, I was All thinking right. different card. 
No, just kidding. Interesting. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go with uh, Star Alliance here. Seems like a good choice. I'm going to archive the Ghost Hawk. Mm -hmm. Play the Kirby and put the upgrade on gray. Mm -hmm. like Mm, very nice. All right, let's go Logos. Okay. Mm. Yep, that was expected. Mm. The good thing I didn't put the uh, Light of the Archons on the Kirby, or they both would have died. Yep, absolutely. All right, what do you like here? Let's go back into Star Lines. Okay. Cool. That was cool, JG. I liked uh, I liked getting the Hexbeon out there before the standardized testing. Mm-hmm. Ooh. First Kin Can. This is the tough call now. Um, mm -hmm. Discard it. If he's got back here. I'll, uh, I'll let you criticize me. But I'm going to send back the Igor as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I actually like that a lot. I think um, we just saw him go into you, Logo, so... I'm not expecting him to go back. And if he does, we still get the, the Kin Can trigger. So yeah. a little more extra Amber Patrol. The Kin Can is what did it for me too. Mm -hmm. Hope Murph's watching. Uh, let's go Brobnar. Brobnar, okay. I'll take that steal. Oh, I guess we Nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That's an early combo. Drummer, not go burr. <laughs> so that's one of your badges, right? Ooh, uh, yeah. I'm not gonna, not gonna, oh. I'm not gonna assume any decisions here, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Very nice. Let's go into Untamed here. Okay. Um, all right. Not not super easy here, but I th think I'm going to do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to Get rid of the drummer knot first. Um, question is, do I want to also bounce the ganger chieftain? And that, I think, he only drew one card last turn, so I think I'm going to bounce that ganger chieftain, try to chain him, and kill the drummer knot. And let's go. Should I have bounced the Brammo too? Was that a mistake? I was thinking about it. Um, it's uh, it's up to you. I doubt he'll go back into Brobnar again, so you might have been able to get an extra chain in the hand. Yeah. But uh, I don't hate it. Hmm. I guess it, it does mean that he can kill both of these creatures here. 
Yeah. If he, although if he kills the mustic, he will give us a key. First blood. Good point. Mm. Ooh, tough one. Let's go. Let's go, Logos. <clears throat> okay. Oh, he pitched the might makes right. Feels like a relief to me. And the Mars needs Amber. Mm -hmm. I like it. Interesting. Maybe that means it was a couple of really good Igors there. <laughs> yeah. Pitch in the Kichi for some extra efficiency. Maybe no Robnar in the hand, perhaps. Otherwise... I feel like that could almost as surely is a guaranteed hit. Interesting. Although, we'll see how long the game goes. They might be able to cycle back to it. Yeah, could be pretty brutal later, too. Mm hmm. Oh, the Ganger Chieftain goes. All right, so he's still got the other Ganger Chieftain in hand, though. All right. Cool. Uh, so it ends with a hand of eight. Okay. So what did you think of the, the house call there, JDG? Would you have gone with a different house? Well, I was considering Mars, but I think Logoson was pretty good. I think we were able to get a, a whole bunch of uh, Logos creatures on board. Mm -hmm. And they've used both their nature's calls. Uh, they've already played Mustache Marmok. Um, so I think the main board control is zap, the two double zaps. Mm -hmm. Let's go with uh, Logos here. Oh, yeah. All right. So I've already thought about this sequencing, and I think I know what I want to do. Oh, wow. Okay, now let's go. Now let's go Mars. Okay. It's a big hand. Probably a lot of Mars there. Yeah, I'm scared. Mm hmm. Okay, there's the key oh, objection already. Oh, crap. <laughs> I can't stop that sequencing. Oh. 
All okay. good. <laughs> All good. So far, I'm pleased with the uh, the lack of value from some of these. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Oh, I feel All like right. I, I feel like we dodged a bullet that turn. We we definitely did. Um, hmm. All right, we'll see how you feel about this. We're gonna go untamed here. Yeah, I think that's um, largely what I was thinking too. Okay. Um, and I am going to take the archives. Yeah, got that ghost hawk coming back. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's start with the ghost hawk. And we are gonna get a couple good reaps in here. And archive something. Um, hmm. Let's go with that one. Get some skirmish out there. Let's see if I want to fight or reap here then. Um, I guess, uh, JDG, that was a brilliant play destroying your own combat pheromones to take that amber away from me. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I dig it. Um, yeah, let's... Um, I think I'm just going to... I think I'm just going to reap out here. Zoom, indeed. Yeah, if I if I could, uh, yeah, just gonna reap out here. Yeah, there's not a few, bad call at all. Yeah, there's a few things that I I wish I could have killed the Bramo, um, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't want to fight with two things, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. We'll we'll see what they end up doing. I still think we're in we're still in a good spot. It's a tough call here. And I am curious afterwards, too, if you would have gone Logos instead of Mars in the previous turn. Um, here we are with an interesting decision. I am going to say Logos. Logos. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, let's just do that first. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so there shuffles everything back in. That's mm -hmm. a, a good point. But discarding the might makes right earlier, it just comes right back. Right, definitely. Hmm. See what else they end up doing. Right. Question is, do I want to reap or do I want to fight with all these?
Okay. Actually, yeah, we'll do that. Cool. Right on, right on. All right. I guess, ST, I got, I got to forge the red key. That's your family rule. That's the rule. <laughs> All right. Let's go Star Alliance here. Right. Very tough here. There's so many different ways I can I can take this one. Mm -hmm. So I like that last turn, getting the bibliophile off board. Really nice. Um, Sorry, getting the... Oh, the bibliophile? I like getting that off the board for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a pain in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I was um I was contemplating if I should um if I should have uh destroyed the Hexpian and like fought it with like let's say the Gosok to archive the card. Mm -hmm. But I kinda wanted to get to seven amber. Yeah, I I really like getting to check, especially against Hartley, which has mm -hmm. uh is re really limited on amber control. Mm -hmm. And we see them going to Star Alliance. Decent chance they drop a King Can on us and we get to Call houses mm -hmm. with impunity. Yeah, I am uh, wow. not taking the archive there. Um, I don't actually know if you know what's in the archive, ST, do you? Yeah, I, I see it. Oh, you do see the archive. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it was, if it was open. Yeah. All right. I wasn't sure if you were, if you'd grab that or not. Yeah. But... Um, it's a tough decision either way. It is a tough one. And we can talk about it maybe after the game. I don't want to give too much away at the moment. Sure. Um, this is real tough here. This these zaps. Like yep. I think I'm gonna take out the time traveler. I think I wanna drop one on the Mermook and I got one more here. I think I'm going to drop. Go. Uh, hmm, no, nah, this is rough. Um, put one on Igor. And then I'm going to play the other zap. Get rid of the Igor. Not my Igor. And. Get rid of that big boy. I don't know. That's, there's so many things that I was thinking about there. Um, that with the zaps, I'm very afraid of the coward's end. Yep. Um, I thought about putting a few pings on all of mine, but um, I just... I needed to bring down his board a little bit, I think. Yeah, no, I think I thought you played that turn turn very well. You know, grabbing the stealth mode out of the archives was like a, a probably the biggest decision you'd have to make whether you want to save it for later or play it now. But yeah. I like the I like the the choice to save it. Um I think that especially, you know, not really sure when the might makes rights didn't come back around. So Definitely yeah. want to hold it, and so we can try to sneak in key three if we get the opportunity. Yeah, there's going to be a, a pretty crucial point later, I think. <laughs> <laughs> JDG, you don't even you hold quite it in. Face. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even hold it in. <laughs> uh, oh my uh, gosh, I... I'm sitting here like sweating buckets because I'm sorry, I can't help it. I see the like. The little thumbnail, it just shows it to me. What's in your archives, you know? I'm not, I don't have to like, yeah. go open. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I, I smell a might makes right walk off then. Let's go, Brobnar. Okay. What will be our next turn? 
Mm. Yeah, I don't think there's anything I could have done about it. Even the stealth mode would really just delay the inevitable for one turn. I mean, we, yeah, have, uh, yeah. we had it, it 20 power on Brobnar in hand. Yeah, it was... Uh... Yeah. yeah. Was... Oof. Uh... Yeah, not much Not much we could have done about that. But yeah. you, played, you played it very well, Quick Draw. Yeah, yeah. we... Uh, there's a lot less Amber Control than I actually thought. GG, guys. Nice job. GG. Very GG. Um, GG. The Garcia just came now at the end. Um, I wanted the cutthroat a little bit earlier, and it didn't show yep. up. Um, and then the Kin Can only got one value out of it. So. Um, yeah. You got a little un unlucky. With early, we had a pretty nice setup with the double um, Nature's Call with the Kirby and the Ghost Hawk in the Archive. So you had a really nice setup to be playing out of house. And then we would also be able to drop Val Val in the center line. But you that double the Bramo clearing and that early gang or not really set our game plan behind. So sure. it was very, very well played, JDG and JT. Very well played indeed. <laughs> indeed. And yeah, it was uh we were joking at the end. I I think it was probably probably right to hold the stealth mode there. I mean, uh you yeah. it's like you could buy a turn now, but that's there's no real, there's no value in that, right? Uh you're better off mm -hmm. better off saving yourself later, probably. Um but uh, yeah, that yeah. Was I, a, I don't have any draw. creature control anyway, so you would drop your Brobnar. I have no way to remove them, and mm -hmm. yeah, you just play it next turn. And interesting, okay. I don't know, JDG. What do you think? If if they stealth moded us, do you think we should go into Brobnar, commit all those bodies to the board, or or maybe we just go into Logos and hope you leave us? Because we yeah, had, we had twenty, we had twenty, 20 power, power in hand. You know, so it's like mm -hmm. if you leave us with a couple a couple of logos bodies, we're feeling pretty good still. Uh, interesting. Yeah, you had talked earlier, JDG, about how the creature control was basically gone at that point, and then mm -hmm. seeing both zaps like that was literally it. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The um. Yeah, and we didn't get the big uh, Pampaka turn either for um some nice skirmish yeah. fights, which was kind of also a little unfortunate for us, but. The uh, yeah, the Pentaka can be really, really useful, especially if you can protect it behind some taunt. Yeah, I mean, maybe I could have fought those two turns then, because he did just have a big Logos reap that turn before, so maybe the fighting would have been a, a safer play in a deck with not very much creature control. Yeah, it's hard to say. You could have, you maybe you could could have cleared like two creatures, but yeah. I don't know. I think uh, yeah, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place at that point. You kind of want to keep pushing Amber, especially because we felt it felt to me like we felt behind or behind an Amber in the early game. So in, in or not, place, I mean, yeah. a six Amber swing and a matchup with very little Amber control is pretty huge. Yeah, and yeah, the body's exactly. Maintain the board. I mean, uh, I think this this may be one of the better kind of Brobnar uh, AOA sides that I've seen. I mean, you've got double ganger, mm -hmm. double, double drummer, the brammer to go with the drummer knots. So many, what, how many bodies? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten creatures? Is it ten, ten creatures? Yeah, in Brabham. Yeah. Yeah, a lot yeah. of bodies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. And all five yeah. places for Bramo. Yeah, and that Lobo's efficiency getting you guys online early was also really nice. I could see uh, from you know from the brain side, I could see you guys crafting hands, which was really really interesting to see what um where you're building up for, especially that Mars turn was um I was wondering when you guys were going to pull the trigger on that, just seeing them accumulate in the hand. Did it feel like it was the hand was clogged with Mars throughout the game, like you didn't want to play the house, or was it um was there ever was it a deterrent at all throughout the game? I never felt like our hand was clogged. There there was definitely a point where we had, you know, Logos board. I think it was Logos board and three or four yeah. Mars pips in hand. And it's like, uh, are we, should we unload these pips? Should we play the board? Um, I think, you know, we had four, four mm -hmm. Mars cards, two Logos, and then two more in archives, including the help, including the uh, time yeah. traveler. Um, and it felt a little awkward uh, I'm not sure I led you down the, the best path there because we we unloaded the logos, built up this big lotus board, and then the next turn uh, cleared out the Mars. Maybe we should have cleared out the Mars first and then gone logos. I don't know. 
Um, mm. What do you think, JDG? Would you have gone different houses, house sequencing there? Mm, I'm not sure. If, I felt like both options worked. I think the only thing that mm. I was concerned about uh, was, uh, was because we were rushing for Amber, so I was afraid of like a cutthroat mm. or a sensor Garcia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, didn't have the cutthroat, and then when you fought with the Hexpian instead of reaping to eight, I kind of like foiled my idea of like maybe if we go logos, I'll draw two cards and run into cutthroat. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was a good play to stay at seven there. Um, also, I, I liked the choice of destroy them all to kill the uh, group think tank. Um, mm-hmm. St, I'm wondering the way I laid out those logos, three of them would have died from the think tank, but had he not killed the think tank, would you have gone logos there just to um, reap a few times, draw archive, and then wipe a lot of his board? Yeah, I, I definitely would have thought about it. Absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a key creature in the matchup and staggering them like how you did, I think it was very, very important for the late game if we went there. So having it, just being able to use it, and then from there, sequence alternating. Um, Stagger so them that, completely. Yeah. Like, I knew I was yeah. going to lose three of them. Um yeah. But the reason I put him where they were is because if he had another drummer knot, he could pull the Bramo back, and mm-hmm. I wanted to leave something beefier on the flanks, which was the uh, the um, mm-hmm. think tank, and then the uh, the garbage guy. I forget what his name is. Oh yeah, the uh, sanitation engineer. So yeah, so yeah. That was an interesting turn because I I was imagining hitting the bibliophile. But I do, mm. I do, in retrospect, think that the um, the think tank was the right choice, and the only reason I was leaning towards the bibliophile was because of the um, the ghost talk too, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but ooh, really interesting. No, the uh, the the think tank was absolutely the right call. So good on mm-hmm. good on the hand for for uh, being smarter there for sure. I think I'm on a big losing streak on the hand and brain. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's at least three weeks, maybe four. So um, just consider that next time we play ST. Um, don't be so quick to choose me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pick you from now on, Quick Try. You're stuck with me, all right? <laughs> awesome. Have to get off the schneid, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Very good. Well, this is a lot of fun. Um, we should wrap it up here. We've gone, gone, gone a little long, but... Uh, Definitely a lot of fun, good times. Hopefully folks uh, enjoyed the Exad conversation. And, uh, ooh, oh yeah, if anybody wants to stick around, um, stick around, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably, maybe I'll hang out for another 10 minutes and then we'll uh, we'll raid you, Zoc. Um, looks like Zoc's got a- <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let us know when you're live, Zoc. We're, we're gonna raid you for sure. Absolutely. Um, Thanks for coming on, JDG. It was good to have you on for the yeah. debut on this work. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, you guys will hold down the fort next week. I'm going to be out. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, this will be interesting. We'll have to think of what to uh, what to uh, do in your absence. Um, I kind of do like the idea of of piggybacking on the ABR formats and we're doing uh, adaptive this week. I would have loved to have you around to talk adaptive best of three. I know we talked best of one. Um, yeah, we had Beehawk on uh, a few weeks ago, talked a lot of adaptive there. I think it was, was that one more focused on BO1 or was that best, best of three? Like how did we, I forget that now. We did touch on best of three. It was more focused on best of one. Um, that was that was kind of what we had crafted the, the survey we did around uh, surveys we did around and we really yes, focused on right. chain bidding uh, I bet you a, any amount of bucks real or imagined that um, you know Beehawk would come on and say you're better off trying to win in two when a win a Newton game than go to chain bidding so there's already kind of a, some new new uh, things to talk through um, so I don't know maybe we, we can twist Beehawk's arm into coming on and join us next week if yeah. for it. Um, you could also take the opportunity to talk about how bad Whirlpool is. <laughs> I won't be there to refute anything. <laughs> He's not here. Now is our time to talk Whirlpool. <laughs> <laughs>
What's what's your take on uh, Whirlpool, JG? Are you a big Whirlpool fan? You can say no. Quick Draw really isn't a fan. I don't think I've played it enough to have a strong opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't played Keyforge then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've acquired, I'm up to like 23 or 24 Whirlpool decks, I think. Um, I got my first double Whirlpool, courtesy of Kveld. Um Super cool Polish double Whirlpool deck. Um, it's a lot of fun. Like, there's, It's so hard to find a good Whirlpool deck, and some of the good decks just happen to have Whirlpool. Um, mm. But I think it's such a like oh. an underrated card in a lot of ways. Um, it's just really hard to find like the right mix of cards with it. Maybe Alliance makes it easier. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, still holding out hope for the uh, the Unchained Whirlpool deck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess... I, I want to... Fingers crossed. Yeah. I guess same set same set Alliance kind of shuts down. Like, you're not going to make your Whirlpool Pit Lord or Ether Spider Whirlpool deck. Yeah. Um... <laughs> For better or worse. Is it the same set? I, I didn't think it was like same set. I thought it was like cross set. Oh, oh, you oh, unchained. Unchained certainly is cross set. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. The alliance. Uh, You're alliance talking about alliance. Set. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's only uh, one Maverick Whirlpool in existence so far, and that is in mm. Logos. And the deck doesn't really have any synergies with the Whirlpool. It's just a cool oddity. Mm. It's uh, interesting to me. The Maverick, the Maverick rares are actually quite rare, especially if you are particular about the house that they're Maverick in. Um, and maybe, maybe Zoc would be a better person to uh, to answer this. But I think there are um, there are only a only a handful, um, uh, only a handful of different Maverick rares. It's a great segue because Zach obviously loves his Mavericks. His background and his stream is the Mavericks. Um, and uh, we're about to raid his stream right now anyway. So you can go look at all of his cool Mavericks and ask him in the chat what he thinks about uh, yeah. about the Mavericks. Yeah, so heading on over. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll see you next week on the Sloppy Lab. Yeah, so heading on over. Feel free like, to... Uh, Thank you all for watching. Figure out how to... We figure out how to do the raids. <laughs> yeah, so we talked to NKFL all night. Zach's going to play some NKFL. Stick around and watch it. Good luck, Zach. Good luck. Ready to raid in 10 9? Yeah, I've got the rare United Action. That's kind of my favorite one. Mm. That is a cool one. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have any rare Mavericks. Not that I know of. I saw that you were sporting it in your last uh, NKFL lineup. That 